This is the Gospel Hour, making known to this nation the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. And now, here with our message, Oliver B. Green. Lead us, our Father, as we open thy word to study today, honor thy word, the shed blood of Jesus, his precious name, and save that soul that's under conviction, that soul that is disturbed about eternity. Save them, our Father, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm reading today in Acts 16, verses 25 and following. But before I read, let me make this statement. In Acts 16, I think we have one of the most beautiful pictures of salvation by grace through faith that you'll find anywhere in the Word of God. I don't think you'll find a more beautiful picture of salvation. Now, Paul and Silas goes to Philippi, and they attend a Bible class that is taught by Lydia. And I'm sure Lydia invited Paul to teach the class, and he did. And she heard the words of Paul, and God opened her heart. Now that's in verse 14, Acts 16, 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a cell of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us whose heart the Lord opened. She attended unto the things spoken by Paul. Now God opened her heart, but her heart was opened by the Lord God because she heard the word of God preached by the apostle Paul. There is only one power that will open a heart that is calloused by sin, and that's the word of the living God. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Now, this lady was of the elite, and she, she was a merchant. She sold purple, and she was in a very flourishing city, Thyatira, and so she was an elite woman. Now, the next convert in Acts 16 is a soothsayer. Now, Lydia was saved the first time Paul preached the cross. Certainly he preached the cross. That's what he preached everywhere he went. He didn't preach to anybody or anywhere that he did not preach the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he preached the cross to Lydia. There is no doubt in my mind about that. Now, he preached many days. This soothsayer followed Paul many days and finally, she was saved. Now, it took quite a few messages to soften her heart because she was a very wicked woman. She was demon-possessed. And Paul commanded the spirit, the demon, to come out of her. And she was saved, and she stopped bringing money in for her masters. She was, they, of course, her masters, were making merchandise of her soul, and so she stopped working for them, and they became angry, and they brought Paul and Silas in, and they were beaten, and they put them in the jail, and they fastened their feet in stocks in the inner cell. Now, verse 25, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed. They prayed when Lydia was saved. They prayed in verse 16 when the soothsayer was saved. Now they're praying again, and somebody's going to get saved. Amen. They prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly, yes, God works many times in a very sudden manner. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundation of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison awakened out of sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing. Now, you know, I preach a sermon sometimes in my meetings. In fact, it is in one of the cloth-bound books that I published on supposition. Now, the jailer supposed, and he almost committed suicide and dropped in the hell, supposing. Now, some of you folks are supposing. I stop here because I feel it is necessary and I feel it is profitable to stop and say this. Some of you folks say, well, I don't suppose I am one of the elect. You want me to tell you something? If you're lost, Jesus came to save you. Now, are you lost? If you're not a Christian, you're lost. If you're not born again, you're lost. And you don't need to suppose. Well, you say... 
Do you suppose God will save me, preacher? I don't suppose God will save you. I know God will save you. If you are a sinner, if you'll repent of your sins and believe on Jesus, He'll save you. I don't suppose about it. I don't need to suppose. I know what the Bible tells me. Now the jailer almost cut his head off and took a shortcut to the lake of fire, supposing that the prisoners had fled. Now, of course, in Philippi, when a jailer lost a prisoner, he paid with his own life. If someone escaped, he paid. They killed him. They crucified him. They, they executed him. And so the jailer was about to take his life. And uh, we read on, but Paul cried with a loud voice. You know, a lot of people don't believe in loud preaching. Now, I can't, I tell you, I'm sorry if it offends you. I'm sorry because I, I like to have friends. I don't want enemies. I don't want any enemies. But, uh, beloved, I tell you, I, I just can't preach in that way. I've been doing this 32 years, and I, I can't quit now. I, I just, I, this is the only way I know how to preach. I've tried to settle down and talk real low and kind and sweet, but that's not me. I can't do it. Now, Paul was a loud preacher. He certainly was, and he cried out with a loud voice. And here's what he said, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. No one's gone anywhere, jailer. Put up your sword. Don't take a shortcut to hell. Just put your sword up because we're all here. Every prisoner can be accounted for. No one has gone anywhere. And so the jailer called for a light. Now that's very interesting to me. He called for a light. The prison was in total darkness. So is every sinner. Every unbeliever is blind. Not your eyes, your mind. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, he said, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this age hath blinded the minds of them that believe not. Blinded the mind, the mind, not the eye, the mind. And, of course, every sinner is in total darkness. And when Jesus saves us, we are translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Colossians 1 13. So the jailer called for a light. Now I'm giving you the light today, and I'm turning on the light. The gospel is the light. The word of God, the entrance of the word brings light. The word is a light and a lamp, and I'm turning on the light. Now if you're in the dark, and if you want to come out of the dark and get in the light, you just stay with me just a few more minutes, and I'll tell you exactly how you can be translated out of darkness into light translated out of the kingdom of sin into the kingdom of righteousness, translated from death to life in the Lord Jesus. So he called for light, and he sprang in. And he came trembling, and he fell down before Paul and Silas, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, I'm going to stop here and let me make this very clear before I say it. I'm not demanding that you have the same experience that the jailer had. Now, I'm not demanding that. I'm not saying that you must spring in and come trembling and fall down. I'm not saying that. But I'm going to tell you, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. Now, when it says he sprang in, that means I, I presume he ran. He ran. He literally jumped and ran, and he was trembling. He was just shaking all over. And he fell down. He fell down. He didn't stand up. He fell down. Now, I believe with all of my heart in getting on your knees. I believe in an altar. When I used to say, preacher, I thought you believed in grace. I do believe in grace. I do believe in grace. I believe that God saves us by His grace plus nothing. That's right. But I'm going to tell you something. When you're convicted of sin and you know that you're dropping into, the, into hell and your next breath may be the last breath and you may drop into hell and you realize the need of a Savior and you begin to tremble and in your heart you say, in the heart, not with the lips, in the heart, you say, I believe Jesus, Son of God, died on the cross, buried, rose again. I believe His blood cleanseth from sin. When you say that in your heart, your old body will want to bend its knees and close its eyes and get down some folks, brother, on their face. Yes, sir, down on their face and just do a little weeping, a little squalling, a little praying, a little repenting, and just thank God for saving you. Now, you're not saved by praying. You can fall down, spring in, tremble and cry and scream and beg. Yes, sir, but that won't save you. 
But that's a good sign when you come trembling and you fall down upon your knees. That's a good sign that God's working in your heart. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm not trying to put everybody in my little circle. That's not it. I'm not trying to make everybody preach it just like I preach it. Of course, I'm talking about uh, state it like I state it. Now, we all preach the same gospel. If we preach the gospel, we all preach the same gospel. But now, there are churches that have altars out front. That's all right. Other churches have rooms. They call them inquiry rooms or prayer rooms. They have a, a, a room, and it should be right at the pulpit. I mean, you should not carry or you should not be forced to lead people down a long hall uh, to a prayer room because the devil is shrewd. He's smart. And if we use the prayer room, it should be right at the pulpit where we can go in and uh, immediately. And, of course, if we use the altar, it has its advantages and in this day and age, there are some disadvantages. For instance, uh, if the service is dismissed, many times a crowd of people come up to shake hands with the preacher, and they disturb the people who are being prayed with. Now, that ought not to be. But I'm saying this. I'm not demanding that you do exactly as I would do if I were a pastor, and I'm not. I'm not. But I do say this. God deliver us from these cut and dried hand-shaking, card-signing, line up with us, do better, invitations. God help us. God pity us. Brother, when a man or a woman gets under deep conviction, they're not going to walk down the aisle chewing their chewing gum, smiling and looking at everybody and smiling and, and walk down and shake the lovely hand of a lovely preacher. No, sir. I'll guarantee you when they're under conviction... And they don't care who is looking at them. They don't care what people think about them. And they'll want to get out on their knees, most of them. There are very few people, very, very few people that object to getting on their knees when they come forward to be saved. And they don't want anybody to say, would you like to line up with us? Would you like to get baptized? Would you like to join? They want to get born, not join, born. And when you get them born again, they won't spoil. They'll keep. They'll keep till next Sunday. Oh, yes. You don't have to get them in that very minute. They'll keep. If they're born again, they'll keep. And if God wants them in your church, the Holy Ghost will lead them there. And if the Holy Ghost doesn't lead them there, you're better off without them. And don't you forget that. Some precious pastors, and God bless you, pastors. I'm not your enemy. I'm your friend. I'll guarantee you I'll love you, and I'll work with you, and I'll fight for you. But I won't compromise. I won't compromise. I promise you. But some dear pastors ask for trouble. Get a banker or a lawyer or a doctor saved, and brother, they vote him in immediately. And bless your heart, put him on the uh, this committee and that committee and make him a deacon and make him this and make him that. And sometimes you're making a hard, hard bed. And later you'll wish you had never invited him to join your church. Now, that's not true always. That's not true always. But many times it has happened, and I've learned in these many years that I've been preaching and traveling, I've learned some things that I wish I didn't know, and I mean that. So, he sprang in. He didn't come walking in right slow, grinning, chewing his chewing gum. No. He sprang in. He came trembling. And he fell down. They didn't have to ask him to get down. He fell down. And he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now, Paul didn't say do anything. Paul said believe. And that's faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him... The word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. Now, Paul didn't give him ten simple lessons on how to become a good Baptist. You say, Brother Green, I thought you were Baptist. I am Baptist. I'm Baptist. I'm not ashamed of it. Don't brag about it, but I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed that I'm a Baptist. I'm an old-fashioned, Bible-believing, Bible-believing Baptist. I'm an old-fashioned Baptist, like the old-fashioned Baptists have always been and always will be. But Paul and Silas didn't give him ten easy lessons on how to become a good Baptist. No, sir. They didn't instruct him how to be a good member 
The Word of God tells me here that they spake unto him the Word, W-O-R-D. Now the Word brings conviction. The Word brings the light. The Word brings, that is, the Word is the incorruptible seed. And we're saved by God's grace. And grace becomes ours by faith, and faith becomes ours by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So you see, our part is to hear the Word of God. Hear the Word. And the Word brings saving faith, and we exercise saving faith in the finished work of Jesus. And then the miracle is performed. We're saved by God's grace through the miracle of the Holy Spirit borning us, baptizing us, uniting us to the body of Jesus Christ. Now watch it. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his Immediately. Now that's what that word straightway means, immediately. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Now it doesn't tell us how he rejoiced. When some people rejoice, they cry. They just cry and cry and boo-hoo. They're rejoicing. Tears just stream down their face, and yet they're so happy they can't contain themselves. So that's the way they rejoice. Other people clap their hands, and they shout, Hallelujah, Amen, praise God, glory to God, and that's the way they rejoice. And other people just sit, and bless your heart, they may smile. And they just sit there and rejoice, and their heart is so filled and so full, and their, their, their cup is running over. But they don't wave their arms, they don't scream, they don't cry, they just rejoice. So you cannot, you cannot write a rule for rejoicing. Can't do it. Now, the, the, the salvation that God gives, Peter tells us, brings joy unspeakable. So you can't describe it. Joy that salvation brings is unspeakable and full of glory. Now, the jailer rejoiced. Now, here's what we see between verses 12 and 36 in the book of Acts. We have the account of three tremendous conversions. One, a society lady of the elite. She was a merchant. She sold purple. She lived in a flourishing city. She heard Paul. God opened her heart. She was saved. The next is a soothsayer. She was the property of men who used her to bring in money. And she would use her witchcraft to bring money to the men who were making merchandise of her soul. She followed Paul and Silas many days, and she confessed that these men are the servants of the Most High God, and they show us the way of salvation. Well, now, the only way in the world to show anybody the way of salvation is with the Word of God. So Paul was preaching the Word, the Word, the Gospel, the Gospel. Paul was preaching the death, the burial, the crucifixion, the blood, the resurrection. Paul preached the Gospel. And this soothsayer heard it, and she was saved. And then they arrested Paul and Silas and put them in the inner cell in the jail. And at midnight they sang and praised God and prayed, and all the prisoners heard them. And then God said, Amen, and everything flew wide open, and the jail was wide open, and all the shackles and leg chains, irons, fell off, and Paul and Silas were released from the stocks, and the doors were all open, and the old jailer was fast asleep. But he woke up when God said, Amen, with an earthquake, and he, the first thing he thought of was his own poor neck, his own poor head, and so knowing, or thinking rather, supposing he knew what they'd do to him, they knew he'd cut his head off, they'd cut his head off, if the prisoners were gone, he'd die, and supposing that they were gone, he was about to commit suicide, and naturally he'd drop into hell if he commits suicide, because he was a poor sinner, but Paul cried out with a loud voice, he was a loud preacher, and so he cried out with a loud voice, and he said, do thyself no harm, we're all here, we haven't gone anywhere, we're right here, and so he called for a light. He called for a light. And the entrance of the Word of God brings light. The Word is a light. The Word is a lamp. And so he called for a light. And he sprang in. He just literally jumped in and sprang in. He ran in and he fell down. He didn't carefully kneel down and brush a place off on the floor where he'd be sure not get his trousers dusty. He just fell down in the dirt, dust, or whatever it was. He just fell down before Paul and Silas, and he said, Sirs, 
what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on Jesus. And then they went into his house and they preached unto him the word of God and to all that were in his house. They spoke the word. Now, there is no salvation. There's no such thing as being saved until you hear the word. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation. We become a Christian by hearing the word of God. Hear the word, believe on Jesus, and thou shalt be saved. Now, Acts 1.8 is the key to the book of Acts. Acts 1.8 is the key. And the disciples were instructed to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endued with power, and then they would be witnesses. And so Paul and Silas were certainly witnesses. They witnessed to Lydia. They witnessed to the soothsayer. They witnessed to the jailer. And God saved them all. My, my. From the elite to the poor witchcraft, woman practicing witchcraft, and then to the poor pagan ungodly jailer. The gospel will reach them all if we'll just get the gospel to them all. Father, in the name of Jesus, honor thy word, save every soul that's under conviction, reclaim the backslidden, revive the indifferent, and strengthen the weak for Jesus' sake. Amen.